Welcome. Uh, it's great to see you all. Uh, welcome to the National Book Festival. Uh, this is Bring on the Blur, Reality versus Fantasy with Kim Fu and Lydia Yuknovich. Um, great to see you all. Uh, first, I just want to thank our, uh, our sponsor for this event, the National Endowment for the Arts, um, which is just a, a great sponsor to have. Um, my name is Kevin Larimer. I am the editor-in-chief of Poets and Writers, uh, where I edit Poets and Writers magazine. Um, and I am joined, I'm absolutely thrilled, um, a little overwhelmed, but thrilled and honored uh, to be joined by um, these two just amazing, brilliant authors. Uh, and I'm just going to read their, their bios real quick. Uh, Kim Fu is the author of two novels, a book of poetry, and most recently, the story collection, Lesser Known Monsters of the 21st Century. Awesome book, if you haven't read it. Yes, please. Great book. Uh, which received starred reviews from Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, Booklist, and Quill and Choir. Her first novel for Today I Am a Boy was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award and a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice. Her second novel, The Lost Girls at Camp Forevermore, was a finalist for the Washington State Book Awards. She lives in Seattle, but fortunately for us, she is here in Washington, D.C. today. Lydia Yuknovich is the best-selling author of the novels Thrust. Let's hear it. Yes. Uh, the Book of Joan, The Small Backs of Children, and Dora, A Head Case. She is the recipient of two Oregon Book Awards and has been a finalist for the Brooklyn Public Library Literary Prize and the Penn Center USA Creative Nonfiction Award. Yuknovich also wrote the story collection Verge and the memoir The Chronology of Water. She lives in Portland, Oregon, but here she is. So let's, let's hear it for our two amazing authors. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, so I want to get to the blur, because I find the premise of this conversation pretty fascinating. But before we get to that, I think um, it might be a good place to start is just to talk a little bit about kind of the origin stories of these two books. So if you would, this also kind of gets me out of trying to describe <laughs> your book, Lydia, See, because no. <laughs> it is indescribable, I find, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's so complex and the, you know, both of these books, the imaginations on display are just amazing. So, but I thought maybe you could both uh, speak a little bit about kind of the origin stories of these books, sort of how did, how did they start? How did you come to write them? I think you have to start because yours was described in that way. <laughs> <laughs> Your indescribable book, please describe it. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Um, well, there are, if I could say there are touchstones or places in my imagination that uh, fired up. Uh, one is that when I was a child, I used to jump into waters before I learned to swim. And uh, any water, pools or rivers or oceans or off docks, um, and they did teach me to swim because they became terrified I was going to drown. But that feeling of wanting to be in water no matter what uh, is foundational for me. It's profound for me. I'm still more comfortable in water than I am on land with the peoples, although you're all lovely and very attractive. <laughs> um, so, so that was in there. Uh, the Statue of Liberty, perhaps you've heard of it. <laughs> but not the stories we inherited, whatever they are. Uh, I was becoming obsessed with whoever the laborers were, the builders, the workers, the designer a little bit, but mostly the actual bodies of the actual laborers, because I was working with laborers at the time whose body stories never make the news. So that got in there. And then I think a, an easy, fast thing to say is I'm obsessed with history. And I don't mean history is true as it's written. I mean, I understand history as a series of stories that swirl around. And underneath those stories that were given are the stories underneath those. And I'm more interested in that. <laughs> and so 
uh, the stories of people ordinarily shoved to the side or erased or buried or silenced. That's the history I'm looking to unearth. And so those are some of the ideas um, that got me going on this novel thrust. And I'd add one more, which is, again, as a kid, I was obsessed with collecting objects. I was very weird. Um, <laughs> although I think all kids are pretty weird. Would you agree with that? Yeah, they're weird little creatures. Uh, but I ate some of my objects. And I had a disorder called um, pika or pika. And so I ate some rocks and I ate some seeds, and I ate some dirt. I can see you trying not to laugh. It's a little <laughs> bit funny. It's a little bit funny. Uh, and paper, ate a great deal of paper. Um, and so as I was conjuring character, that got in there too. Only the objects became magical, which they, of course, are. Meh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And oh yeah, climate change and police state, and I'm going to stop now. Right. Time travel. And time travel. Time travel, yeah. Okay. Kim? It, it's magnificent. Thrust is magnificent. You should absolutely read it if you haven't yet. Um, so uh, my first two books were uh, novels, and then I also published a poetry collection. Um, but I've always really loved short stories. Um, I think one of the first books for adults I read was uh, one of Roald Dahl's story collections uh, that had been misfiled as a children's book. Uh, and so I was like, I was like 10 and I was like, oh, you know, oh, like another Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And then I was like, oh dear God. <laughs> like it was, it was really, you know, violent and sexual and like fascinating, but it still contained the same this same sort of a magical way of looking at the world uh, that his works for children had. Um, and my interests as a writer, I feel like, are always changing in a way that I don't feel like I have any control of. And then even as I've, I've always loved short stories, there just came a point around 2017 where very suddenly they were all I wanted to write. And for three years, I was like, they were all I wanted to read, they were all I wanted to write. I was just obsessed with the form. Um, and initially, I was worried about saying I'm writing a short story collection because that felt really presumptuous or even jinxy. And so I would say like, I'm writing a bunch of short stories though. <laughs> um, uh, but then I reached a point where there was a significant number of them and I had this vague sense they were thematically connected. Um, and I had been sending them to a friend and I asked her, you know, what, what stands out in your mind about these stories? Uh, and just offhand, what she remembered were some of the stories had literal monsters in them. They had flesh and blood monsters in them that you could, you know, look in the eye and fight. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a sea monster, there's a bug infestation. And her, her saying that and her envisioning it as a book of monsters, a book about monsters, uh, was really clarifying for me when I thought about the stories that don't have monsters. Uh, some of the stories are more realist uh, and some of them more speculative science fiction um, absurdist. But I felt like thinking about the realist stories as monster stories was very, like it helped me understand them better and how I want to structure the book. Uh, and so I feel like, or I hope that every story has that monster element in it uh, that gives it that kind of focus and that kind of sense of the surreal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how long were you working on these books? You said 2017 this started? Yeah, uh, so I started it in December of 2017. Um, I actually keep a spreadsheet of all the books I read because otherwise I never remember, especially when I'm sitting up here and so I'm just like, <laughs> what were you reading? I was like, um, and the last book I had read that year, I went back and looked because it's interesting to me now, uh, was uh, Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chang. Uh -huh. uh, so I feel like I must have read that and thought like I have to write a short story collection now. Um, and then I was working on it until, so I think, so 11 of the 12 stories were done by 2019, and then uh, one more of them got written in the fall of 2020 when it was already with my publisher, Tin House. Okay. So wait, how long have you been keeping a spreadsheet of the books you've read? Since 2010. Wow. Yeah. How did, why did you start doing that? It's a great idea. I just like, um, do you remember what the sort of impulse was? It's. It's a really fascinating record, like a journal of sorts. Sort of, I can see what was happening in my life obliquely from the list. Uh, you know, just as an example, like the, the year 
the year my father died, the list is extremely short, you know, because it's like that was a, a year that was very difficult to read for me. And then the following year, there's like a whole bunch of books about grief, you know. Uh, it, and then, you know, and then when I think about my writing life, it's interesting to look back on my books and say like, oh, what were the influences? What was I reading when like these things occurred to me? What do I feel like I was in conversation with? Right. Um, it's interesting seeing my interest in genres change, you know, like there's it's like, oh, there's a lot of YA or romance or science fiction or graphic novels or whatever, like in, in this year as I'm, you know, my attention is turning in one way or another. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've also been thought about that. I, I don't have a spreadsheet, although maybe I'll start one now, but I have, you know, kept track in one way or another the books that I've read and I've often thought and, and noticed when there have been long periods where there aren't as many books that I've read and I've often thought, those are the times when the narrative of my life is either more compelling, probably not, probably more like stressful or where I can't take on that other narrative in my mind or something. I don't know. Have you ever had that experience or do you keep a spreadsheet? I do not keep a yeah. spreadsheet, but I'm smitten with you now, Kim, because I hope you take this as a compliment. That is extreme nerd glee. <laughs> I have like nerd glee. <laughs> she has a I'm up here in a sweater vest. That's the <laughs> spreadsheet. Uh, no, but I like your idea about what's going on in your life, making reading and writing waves. I think I identify with that a great deal. Yeah. Well, so getting back to the, the original question, um, Lydia, how long did it take you to, to write Thrust? I, <laughs> <laughs> that long? Since before I was born. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I think I started it uh, a couple years before COVID, or at least one year before the COVID years. Does that sound right, Andy? The person next to you is just going, why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so whatever year that was, I started the research and some little, you know, bursts of, what's that? Mm -hmm. Why is there a turtle? Mm -hmm. um, little pieces. And then... The research obsessively drew me in, and the little bursts started getting louder and having voices and characters, and then I was done for. Right. As long as you bring up research, I was going to get to that later, but let's, let's jump into that part. Um, did the research start, is that where the idea started to gel for you? or Because the novel, while incredibly imaginative also clearly and in your acknowledgments you you know address the fact that there was a tremendous amount of research that went into this and i'm always curious about that kind of piece of especially a novelist's work um you know is it, did the research help the narrative come together or was the narrative already there and you did research to further it the re oh, I have 18 answers. Pick one, Lydia. <laughs> the, re <laughs> the research helped the various threads make a weave. Could I say it like that? Because the threads were trying to go wherever they wanted to, and the research brought me to places where the th narrative threads could cross and weave, and that probably saved my ass. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second thing I'd say about the research, I love research. I missed my calling. I should have been a librarian in a back corner or some kind of research person just in my underwear, just giddy with research. I love it. Um, but I think I research differently than other people do. Um, I research to find what I've been told the facts are. That part may be like other people. And then I look for the places where there's an interstice in the telling where something else could have happened, mm. where the story opened up a little bit and a weird or much different thing might have happened besides what we're presented with. So I'm looking for those openings, interstices, or what I would call portals, where the story could have gone anywhere and didn't. And so as a novelist, that's fascinating, exciting, thrilling to try and invent mm -hmm. uh, the what else that could happen. And I delighted in that in terms of research and history. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. 
Kim, do you, do you have much experience like with your writing process and, and your books? Do you do a lot of research as well? Um, I'm actually going through that right now because I'm working on my next book, which is going to be a novel. Um, and it has, it keeps transforming uh, into different things, but in various forms, it has given me an excuse to interview people, which I really love, mm. um, especially about kind of the, the nuances of their job and their day-to-day -day lives in a way. I feel like you don't, you don't have a lot of pretext to just ask people that, like, right. take me through your day. Like, what does your job consist of in that way? Um, and I really love doing that. It's, I feel like, you know, I think one of the things I love as a reader is that you get to experience so much more than your own one small life, you know, your own one, one body and all that you have access to. Mm -hmm. uh, and that as a writer, I get to just ask people. <laughs> it's like, like, that's one of my favorite things about research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Lydia, you were saying that you, uh, just in terms of the interviewing people, you were interviewing people and that's kind of what started the research for Thrust. You were interviewing workers, is that what you? I was interviewing people, um, laborers and workers everywhere I went in cafeterias and groundskeepers and I was working with some of the people and I was also listening to hundreds of ethnographies, hmm. recorded ethnographies and I started with my so-called family trajectory and listened and listened and then the trajectories of people in my life who I live with and love or work with and those ethnographies became uh, good, challenging questions about what is narrative voice mm -hmm. and what is character. Um, and I liked the question more than the possible answers, so I tried to hold the question open. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you share a couple of possible answers that you are not fond of? Well, I think, I, I think you know this. I did set out intentionally to blow up the form of the novel, and I'm not sorry. <laughs> and you can decide if I did or not, but I want you to know from my heart I meant it. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the ways of scratching at that was to take a traditional notion of character and voice and what we ordinarily do as writers, which is try to inhabit the character and bring the voice to life. And I ask the question, what if that's a colonizing impulse? Mm -hmm. Just to ask it. And if it was, what might one do with character and voice instead on the page? And that led me to a question, what if fragmentation and displacement of voice appeared so that when you get a character, it just shows up briefly, again, like a touchstone, like a moment, and nobody's story revolves, and nobody, one character gets the hero's story, that's gone, that went first, I should fess up to that too, the hero's story, gone. <laughs> uh, and that, see what I mean, that question became mesmerizing yeah. to me, and so if there's anything like an answer around this example, it would be something like, we all have hundreds of voices in us at any given moment. We may present a singular voice, but we're never one voice. And then as groups, we're never one voice. Those voices in groups contradict each other, argue with each other, love each other, embrace each other, um, have free-flowing desire between them. So I was trying to ask, well, what the hell would that look like on the page? Yep. And it just made voice into many different strands on the page. So just about character and voice, yeah. this tiny question, yep. I was trying to hold it open. Fascinating. OK. Another thing that you, and, well, another thing that you said earlier was about um, uh, imagining an alternative to what happened, what you found in your research. And that makes me think about history and sort of how we, what history is presented to us as history and I guess fact, right? Right. Um, but that's who's writing the history and in what context. And that's an interesting, that's an interesting departure point for fiction because it, also gets to reality, which I guess is kind of a segue to my 
initial question that what I wanted it to be was sort of this idea of bring on the blur, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the posing reality versus fiction as sort of like polar opposites. And that's intriguing to me. Um, you know, we, we sort of hear the, that, that saying, like, stranger than fiction, right? And the last few years, longer than that, but acutely over the last few years, that phrase has come up quite a bit in just, just reading the news, right? It's just sort of stranger than fiction. Um, so, but just to, to, to get at how this relates to your works, I'm just sort of uh, wondering if you could um, just talk a little bit about kind of what draws you to the sort of fantastical or sort of speculative premises in your work, if that's a fair question. Kim, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I think some of it is, it's easier for me to get at emotional truths or how something actually feels by, or, I, okay, I think sometimes explain, like describing, hmm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, for example, if you wanted to write about grief, I think yep. perhaps describing a scene at a funeral may not be the most powerful way to access that feeling to me. Perhaps writing about a bog monster more accurately describes like my feeling of grief, my experience of grief, you know, like maybe that feeling is so big that it cannot be contained by describing it literally. Um, I also think sometimes feelings are huge and vague and abstract and in, in this way that where I think sometimes you need an unreal element to focus it down into something that you can really look in the eye and, you know, and, and bring everything to a head in a way. Uh, sometimes you need an imagined technology to do that, uh, mm -hmm. to make these, to, you know, to make these emotions clear enough that you can discuss them in the way you want to. I think part of it too is just that you can, you know, I feel like function, fiction is one of the only spaces where you can go beyond what is possible. And to me, it would be a shame to not take advantage of that. Right, right. I like that term extreme metaphor. That's good. Um, Lydia, how about you? Shockingly, <laughs> I don't see a huge gap between the real and the blur. Right. <laughs> um, or, or put more precisely, I think, um, I suspect that the, the ideas of realism in narrative history are, are a hoax. So, something we've been fed. <laughs> I made our person giggle. <laughs> uh, or that they've come into tension with lived experience. And so I'm a little unclear why so many writers still cling to psychological realism, to be honest. I, I don't know what the draw is anymore. I love Kim's answer that if you really want to express and convey, for example, deep emotion, you'll have to go to an other where and you'll have to draw from language and the imagination to conjure this other where and it kind of leaves psychological realism in the dust hmm. um, to be brought in your body to an experience while reading that, you know, produces affect. Poetry does that, painting does that, Kim's writing does that. I'm like, what the f hmm? <laughs> um, But then my body starts shaking um, but then the other thing I'd say is, and why I say realism is itself a place of interrogation, if you think of the Statue of Liberty for a second, I, in, I interviewed a hundred regular Joe humans, just people, like at coffee shops or wherever I was, and I, and I like a dork, I'm like, did you know <laughs> that the chains that are down by her feet were supposed to be up in the air with her hand? Did you know that? And first of all, at least half the people didn't know there were chains at all. And almost no one had heard this. This is true. I didn't make it up. This is historically accurate, if you care about that phrase. The emancipation trains were supposed to be up for everyone to see in the sky, in her hand, as a version of this idea of emancipation. And so my question would be, there's a fiction buried in the historical realism 
that nobody knows. And so then the question gets really interesting to me, where's the reality, where's the blur, and who was in charge of the blur, and why? And, and so that, you know, so when I hear reality blur, I'm like, who's blur? <laughs> who's reality? Which are we talking about here? <laughs> so are we really gonna talk about it, or are we gonna say, you write sci-fi? Um, so, so that's me getting all sassy about that. But also, I think science fiction itself, and we must have sci-fi readers in the room, right? I think, so, yeah, bless you. I, I don't think I write sci-fi. I was just trying to be precise about what the inside of my head looks like. And <laughs> somebody said it was speculative or sci-fi. I'm like, oh. <laughs> uh, but sci-fi itself as a category is undergoing plate tectonics right now because we used to think of science fiction as something that happened in the future away from us, where the new worlds and dangers, you know, were kind of far away and we could imagine. Now it's up our noses in the present tense. The things that used to be called sci-fi are happening in our present tense in the front yard. And so I suspect that the category itself is, you know, mm -hmm. blurring, wobbling, mm -hmm. doing something like that. Just in terms of like, just getting back to what you were talking about with psychological realism. Isn't it true though that as a fiction writer, you are, it, so are you saying like there isn't enough room to explore within sort of the dimension of, I guess, reality <laughs> or as we know it, or like sort of physical reality? Because isn't that kind of what every fiction writer would do? If you're going to write dialogue, you're actually like trying to put yourself in the mind of another person and explore perhaps you know these emotions. And as you say, Kim, um, you know maybe at a funeral isn't the best way to sort of convey what what grief really is. Um, but I guess I just wanted to I, I wanted to hear maybe just a little bit more about that. Like psychological realism is like too limiting. I, I agree with you that I, I think you know, there's a mechanical way in which they're not different. I think yeah. writing realist and writing surreal or speculative. Um, as, as an example, I think um, sometimes you could, you could read a poem that's about someone losing their religious faith and feel like it spoke to the, your feeling when your boyfriend broke up, to you, broke up with you, you know? And it's like there's a way in which it's like those experiences in a literal way could not be more different, but they're like tapping into an emotion, like an emotional experience, right? There's a way in which it's, it's crossing, like the experience of reading, I think, is, is empathetic and it can cross, you know, time and, you know, dem demographic differences and all kinds of things, right? And I think that that's true in realist fiction, that's true in, in, all, in all genre fiction. Um, I think, you know, it's just, it's just a difference of tools, right? It's just saying, like, I'm using things that are invented or that some people interpret as invented, uh, mm -hmm. In, you know, to cause ultimately the same kind of effect. Like, to, you know, just because it's on a made-up spaceship doesn't make that emotional connection any, right. any less real. Right, of course, right. Okay. Well, so you use the word tool, which is interesting, and it kind of leads me to my next question, which is, I hope not too basic, but kind of, um, do you start with the speculative idea, or does the speculative idea sort of, like, come up naturally for you while trying to tell a narrative? I don't know if you could use your like most recent books as examples of like, did you set out, like did you have this, the idea of like, you know, the, the girl who can swim in the waters of time or, or the 3D printer where you can, you know, reproduce a body and, and transfer of consciousness? Did you have that idea first and then, you know, sort of uh, tell the story around it? Or was it the story and then the, the weird idea? Is that too hard? Uh, so something I've been thinking about recently is yeah. that I feel like ideas are easy and writing is hard. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like ideas are in a real way a dime a dozen. I think anyone could sit down and write 10 premises right now. Um, actually, recently, a friend of mine who's a novelist, uh, she was between, between projects, um, and we were like joking around, and she said, you know, give me an idea for a novel, please. And you know, I said something, and then she was like, 
oh wait, I actually want to write that. And then she was working on it for a little bit and then she came back to me and she was like, would you be upset if I actually wrote this novel? And I was like, no, <laughs> right? Because it's like, I, you just, I just said something, right? I just said a sentence, right? I was like, if you can write a novel, then, right. it, you, know, then you did it, right? Um, like the first, the first story in my collection uh, is about a simulator that can manifest you know, anything that you can fantasize, right? And that's not a original idea for a piece of technology, right? There's tons of examples of that across science fiction and all kinds of media. Um, but my hope is that you know, I did something original with that idea, that I, that I accomplished something emotionally, like I told a small human story within that premise. Um, so for me, it often is, the, the way I work is I try out tons and tons of ideas, uh, and 90% of them don't work on the page. You know, I can't find what it is about that idea that really compels me. I can't find like the sensory image or you know, the character's not working, but it's, it's a very experimental process for me of just try, like, you know, throwing the paint in the canvas and seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, I think even though this might be uh, not quite traditional way to do things. I feel things in my body that are tensions in life. Um, e either I'm haunted by questions or upset by something or looking at something going on in our lived experience that um, throws me into a kind of state of fever. And that feeling leads to, uh, okay, what's the image of that for you? And I tend to conjure images and chase them and follow them more than, hmm, what would a plot for <laughs> the Trump years be? Or, you know, how can I write a whole world inside a brown box? Or I don't have that kind of ideation. I have, mm, I'm feeling something, it won't go away. I have to do something with that energy. What are the images? And some images will emerge and image becomes character, or image becomes plot, or image becomes a very visual-based person. I walk through life overwhelmed by my um, inability to stop looking at images, so I'd say I'm an image, but I should have been a poet, but I can't write a poem to save my life. Mm -hmm. but they're terrible, they're so bad. <laughs> um, and I do draw and paint, but not for the world. For yourself. Yes. Got it. Um, Kim, something that you said um, I find really interesting. The, you, know, you were saying that you know, with the first uh, story in your collection, which is great, uh, it's all dialogue, and it's just a, just a great way to, to, to begin a story collection. So thank you for that. Um, but you know, the, the, um, thinking about the concept for that story and you know, then thinking, well, there is virtual reality and like, you know, what are the sort of uh, um, parallels with, okay, reality versus that fantasy that you were writing. Uh, and it just makes me wonder about sort of the, I don't know if it's standards or what it is, but when we start talking about speculative, I feel like sometimes we're, the, the, the standards for like speculative fiction is like, you've never heard of this kind of thing before ever, you know, and it's like this brand new idea, which is interesting since with realist fiction, I mean, how many books are there that take place in a summer home on the lake and it's about a father and his daughter, or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Where it doesn't feel like there's really maybe the same standard of like imagination, right? Mm. I was just wondering if you two had any thoughts about that. I mean, I, I, I agree with that. I think that it took me a really long time to get over that barrier, in fact. Yeah. I think that you could tell from my earlier novels that I was interested in the uncanny and that there was something leading me in that direction. Uh, but I did feel this unreasonable barrier about speculative fiction, even as it's been something that I've always loved and like read since I was a teenager, um, where I felt like, you know, if I was thinking about an imagined machine, I felt like it had to be wholly original, and I also had to understand the mechanics at the level of which, you know, I could actually invent it, you know, and all of its global repercussions. And, and that's ridiculous, right? Because I'm not actually trying to invent a new device. <laughs> I'm trying to tell a story. 
Um, and as you said, you would never put that limitation on yourself in right. the way that you would in real restriction. Like I would never think like, oh, there are too many stories about an unhappy marriage or there are too many right. stories about caretaking for an ailing parent. I can't write another one. But I would think that um, if I, you know, if I, if I was writing a story about a virtual reality similar and I said like, oh, there's too many books out right now about that. <laughs> um, and, you know, yeah, I, I do think that's, that's an unreasonable expectation that from, it took me a long time to get over that. Right, right. Would it you... is an interesting question. Like when you put the word limitation in, um, that is fascinating to me. But that, like I had a mother who swore till the day she died, she saw a sea serpent over the side of the Golden Gate Bridge while she was pregnant with me. And when, by the time I was old enough for her to tell me that story, I believed her 100%. I still believe her 100%. I'm working on the sea monster, you know, <laughs> getting back to the waters where I belong. Um, and so the fiction within the real has always fascinated me. Magic is everywhere. Beauty is everywhere. Things you can't explain are everywhere. Ghosts are everywhere. We're haunted all the time. And, and so... The limitation is that we approach it to explain it or find the answer. Mm. But the imagination isn't such a space. The imagination takes the limitation and alchemizes it so that what the chair starts off as could turn into anything which happens in both of our storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so that's not like making a binary about realism and speculative that's blurring the binary maybe that's what they meant by the maybe title that's it, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> there's the verses in the title though, there's right? a verses so exception. so maybe it's the idea that the binary has to not hold the binary has to drop for us to remember something we all know which is that those are interchanging and in a dance all the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or something like that yeah i love that i think both of us write a lot about uh children yeah. and, and a, a particular phase of adolescence too. And I, th I think for some of that reason, because that is a phase of life where that liminal space of imagination is really accessible, when the world does feel very genuinely magical, where imaginative play is forming a basis for how you're understanding the world and how you're building your, your understanding of it. Uh, and I think that's like why that's such a fascinating age and like a fertile 100%. ground for stories. 100%. Mm -hmm. I should have mentioned earlier that of the last 15 minutes, we're going to open up to, uh, for questions from the audience. So you have about you know, eight minutes to, uh, to think about that brilliant question you want to ask our authors. But um, in the next eight minutes, what I'd like, love to do, every time I, I speak with authors, I just I can't resist. I, I love to talk about process and just sort of what it looks like when you're working. And I'm just wondering if you could each sort of uh, speak a little bit about the process for writing this. We've talked about the research and we've talked about the amount of time and kind of the ideas for it, but just kind of the actual, the actual process, sitting down to write a little bit. Um, well, I'm grinning like this because my husband Andy is in the audience and he introduced something into my writing process. I mean, I'm going to be 60 and this is the first time I've used this. He introduced the dreaded whiteboard. <laughs> And I almost had to divorce him <laughs> because, ew, I'm not that kind of thinker. I'm like the mess. And I heard mess being spoken of in the presentation before this. I'm that. I make like this abstract cosmology, and then I try to make some order out of that. Uh, but I had made with thrust too many messes. <laughs> and so many storylines, and it was almost impossible to see. And so we fought, and he brought the whiteboard into my magical realm writing room, and we fought some more. But then he did a, a thing that was so beautiful. Instead of making an outline or geometric shapes, he made you know circles and bubbles. He tricked me, is what I'm saying. Because <laughs> he's met me, so he knows me. So he made these big bubbles, and then showed me how they were connected. Um, not that I didn't know any of this, so I'm not trying to say a man helped me see my own work. <laughs> so please don't hear me wrong, because that's not it. But it gave me another visual presentation that helped me connect more in a focused way to my own ideas. 
and then I could see a pattern. And if I can see a pattern, I can make these things you all think of as chapters <laughs> and, and storylines and plots, and, and so I could see a pattern. And I don't ever want to use a whiteboard again in my life. I <laughs> hit it with a hammer in the backyard. I, it's not the whiteboard. It's not about the whiteboard. What I learned was, um, you know, profoundly search for the patterns and let them speak back to you what they need to be mm -hmm. and let go of the things you've been taught as the helmet of what to do and not do. Mm -hmm. if, can that be the answer? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's the answer. So, Kim, Lydia was talking about the mess, which makes me think of your spreadsheet, which is not a mess. <laughs> not I'm just wondering if you had a different process. Uh, contrary to the spreadsheet, um, <laughs> I'm, I, I've actually had to give up on the dream of the whiteboard, is what I would say. Uh, the way I have always worked has been, has been very messy and very inconsistent. Like, I would just be writing down lines and images wherever, you know, on the, the back of my bus ticket or wherever I was. Um, and I would write in bursts, like I would write for three days straight and I'd yeah. not write for months. And I would never know what I was doing. Like I would be stacking up images and scenes and characters and sentences and saying mm. like, you know, are they over here or are they over there? How do these people know each other? Maybe they're in an entirely different context. Um, but there was this period in, of time after my first novel came out where I really wanted to be the right board, whiteboard writer, like so much. I wanted to be the kind of writer that gets up at five every day and sits down and churns out the same number of words and has these great defined plans they chip away at you know, consistently every day that has the whiteboard, that has the post-it notes, that has the outlines. Um, and I knew a lot of writers like that who were beautiful writers. You know, it, didn't, it didn't in any way inhibit their creativity or, or you know, make or make their, you know, their dreams any more like absurd and wild and beautiful. Um, and I was like, I want to be like that so bad. And I wasted so much of my life <laughs> and so much anxiety of trying to work like that. It's terrible. Um, yeah, and it just, it, it never worked for me. And I feel like it's only actually now that I've like, I've truly let it go. I've truly said, I will never be a writer like that, and that's okay. And if I go a couple months without writing, that doesn't mean I'm never going to write again, which is how it feels, right? I just... I, I accept now that I write in this very messy, dream spacey way that is very inconsistent. And it's easier to say that now that I have a few books on my belt. It's like somehow this has happened. Um, the metaphor I often use is it's, it's as though I have four children and someone said to me, where do babies come from? And I was like, I don't know, the stork. Um, <laughs> like it feels very like I, I look at them and I'm like, I don't really know how these happened. But <laughs> I'm beginning to believe that because it did happen, it will probably happen again, even as it is always going to be in this chaotic fashion. Great. What about poetry? Because you've also written a poetry collection. Is, your, is the process very different for writing poetry? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I feel like when I write poetry, it's like I black out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I much more literally don't remember writing poems. And I feel like sometimes it's like, you know, you write a poem. And I, I, I tend to write poems in a single session. And that session might be 20 minutes or it might be like three days or, or it might be like an obsession for weeks. But it's like that poem is all that I'm doing and all that I'm thinking about. Um, and I also feel like poetry for me is more purely expressive, where I think with with prose, with fiction and nonfiction, it's more communicative. Like, I feel like I write fiction and nonfiction to be read, like, because I want to be in conversation with people. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like poetry to me feels more like just pure expression in this way where I, I care a lot less about what people think. Mm -hmm. um, and I, but at the same time, I feel like I've learned so much from poetry that I feel like applies to fiction. Like, I feel like poets and poems in general expect a lot out of the reader. They have a lot of faith in the reader. You know, they think that the reader is going to make leaps and connections that aren't obvious. Uh, and I feel like those can be the most powerful moments in fiction uh, where, you know, that level of engagement and construction is expected from the reader. Uh, so I... I do experience them very differently personally, but I think that there's a lot of crossover in the way, in like the skills of a writer and then also the experience as a reader. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 
Okay, so we have about 15 minutes left, and I would love to invite some questions from the audience now. Does anybody would like to come up and ask something? Oh, we have one. <laughs> the whole 15 minutes just by walking all the way back. Um, hello. Um, I like to write, and I um, was wondering, uh, I'm curious about your process in the, um, in the act of narrowing down your focus, um, what that looks like. I'm a person who attempted to write short stories, which very quickly became novellas, which very quickly became novels, which is now a series of novels, because I can't stop. Um, the ideas keep growing. And so I deeply admire when someone can um, narrow their focus down to a short story or um, even just into a short novel. And I was wondering if you had um, any thoughts on how that has worked for you or any advice on how to keep it contained in a way so that you can stop. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of love the idea that it, it just don't stop. <laughs> But there are, of course, helpful things you can do. Uh, find the heart of the story in the heart, actual heart of the character or characters you care most about. Ask them where they're going, what they're afraid of, what they desire, and see if you can conjure that for a limited amount of time. For example, uh, a day in the life, or an hour, or a week, or one year. You know, put these sort of um, bumpers around it that that give you uh, space that's contained. Um, time helps a great deal if you put some time bumpers around it. Uh, but I still like the idea that you write a novel your whole life and it just never ends and you can't get anyone to read it. That's how it feels. <laughs> Fighting people over for dinner, they're like, ah, she's still doing it. Um, there's there's a wonderful book called Craft in the Real World uh, by Matthew Celeses, and there's, there's an activity in it that's called like add a timer that, is a, that sort of literalizes yeah. um, Lydia saying where it's like put an element in the, in the story that is actually a countdown, like they're like they only have a week before the big climactic thing happens, and it's like what does that do to the story? Um, I think you can also pull out a chunk and examine it kind of beat by beat and say, like on, on several levels, like you can examine it on like if I, every chapter. It's like if I pulled out this chapter, would the story be fundamentally the same? And then you can ask that same question of scenes, you can ask that same question of beats, you can ask that same question of sentences, like, and really, really go in like with a, with a scalpel even. Um, I've worked as an editor before and one of my favorite things to do was uh, what, some, what a writer called the ninja scalpel edit, which is where I would take out thousands and thousands of words and even the writer was sort of hard pressed to say where they had gone. <laughs> Um, and I think that that's, that's, a, that's a really easy skill to practice on other people's work before you, and then develop that eye and turn it on your own. Um, but I think that that's, that's always a good question to ask. It's like, does this need to be here? If it was gone, what would change? Mm. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yes, we have another question. Hello. Um, I have a question about speculative fiction being prescient. Um, like, books often become timely years after their publication like Station Eleven or Handmaid's Tale. Um, I'm wondering what you think writers are sort of pulling from during their process that ends up becoming so timely later on. I think one kind of answer is that we used to talk about, <laughs> I'm old, we used to talk about ideas like the collective unconscious and that artists and writers and people who bear witness or sort of, you know, tendrilling out to a zeitgeist or to a collective unconscious and it was entering their work. Um, and it's not that I think that idea's dead or anything. I just think we're learning to talk about things differently. Um, and I do think artists are having an, a different relationship to the pre their own times, their own present tense. I think there's a kind of um, move toward what do we want to be saying to each other uh, and not just making things for entertainment or money. Uh, is it everywhere? No. <laughs> there's still lots of art being made for entertainment money and huzzah, that's great, fine. But there's this other thing happening where, hey, I want to talk to you. What kind of story do I need to tell so that you'll listen to me? Hmm. Um, 
and whatever we would call that feeling as we are also fracturing so profoundly and radically globally uh, if we could come up for whatever to call that feeling I just described, I think that's what's up, coming up. And I mean globally, I don't mean American lit because that's such a tiny house, we should stop talking about it that way. Um, so speculative, I think, is undergoing adaptation would be a faster way to say that. I, I wrote a novel called The Book of Joan and the villainous creature was, um, a wealthy person who had a um, reality TV show and came to such power when the collapse of nations happened that he became a global leader and um, also he had orange hair. <laughs> huh. And I was starting to write that in 2013. And it creeped me out. I was like, ah! <laughs> Uh, but I think it's worth asking, is speculative turning into something else, adaptation occurring, and what does it mean between writers and readers? What are they trying to say to each other? If I was a writer, I would be sitting and thinking about that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do think that, I mean, I believe the collective unconscious is a thing. I think, you know, writers live in the world, as do readers, you know, we're all, I think we are all, you know, lid drawing from the same pool of concerns and of the moment. And I think the people who are inventing or think they're inventing or, you know, addressing problems in more concrete or inventing technologies, we're all sort of pulling from the same unconscious space. And, you know, even, and, you know, we're, we're yeah, it, the, I, I do believe in that as a concept. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also, <laughs> you know, I, I recently threw away 20,000 words of a novel um, because I felt like what was happening at that moment with NFTs and like the metaverse and like what was coming out of like Mark Zuckerberg's mouth was just too ridiculous. Like it was more ridiculous than like what I could come up with yeah, um, in, that, in that vein. And so there is like, you know, like an, an increasingly accelerating conversation there um, where, yeah, I don't know. Like th th there are things that I think are so absurd and are moving so quickly that it is it is actually hard to like catch it as a writer um, and to like you you rarely even have time to address like your feelings and like the ethical conversations you want to have Oops. before it has yeah, yeah. affected the world and then those conversations are necessarily being led by the companies that you know invent these technologies and they're concerned about their own liability and where you want to have some kind of you know larger philosophical conversation uh, so I feel like it's it's difficult. It's diff I experience it as difficult as a speculative writer right now, um, but but yeah, I do feel like we're we are pulling all from the same dream space. Thank you. Any other questions? Ooh, we have another. Sorry, I'm trying to remember my question <laughs> after processing the brilliance that just came out of both of you. Um, but writing in a speculative space um, where the rules are bendy and timey wimey. Um, is there anything that you feel like through doing that you've learned to be inherently true for you um, as much as anything can be true or any like question that feels central for you guys in your work or as you approach um, kind of the speculative space? How long do you have? <laughs> Are there any? I don't have a long time. I don't know how long they have. Are there any little back rooms with wine? <laughs> Sorry, that's not a conference idea. Um, <laughs> a couple things quickly. One is it has, it has freed me to write the kinds of stories I want to write in the manner in which I want to write them to l just poop out linear time as a concept forever. Just like get that out and let it compost and grow some flowers somewhere. Uh, that, that time itself, and this is true in physics and astrophysics, so just, you don't have to believe me, just go look. <laughs> that linear time is, is not useful, it's not interesting. I understand why we cling to it, because it makes life less scary for puny humans to think of time as linear, um, but it never was and is not now, nor will it ever be, to put it in speculative, thoughtful language. And if that is the case, then the movement 
of characters or trees or elements or planets has a different storytelling constellation. So that's one concept I'd say has freed me up. And then another is we have no idea who we are as humans. And we're in some kind of developmental stage maybe where we're finding out more. Um, but that to let go of the idea we have any effing clue who we are or how to relate to each other or the planet or the universes or galaxies. And that means we could be anything. That's the upside. Um, or the characters you create could be anything and inside a becoming, which is what we are. We're inside a becoming and nobody in the room knows where that's going to land. So for a speculative writer, that's like joy. That's a gasm area. I think that the ability for other people to relate to what feel like such strange off off the wall ideas. Like I experienced this reading your book, Lydia, too. Sorry. That, well, no, I mean, like, like you could say something that just sounds superficially absurd. You know, like in in the in the in the way of manner of poetry, you can say like, doesn't this experience feel like a leaf? And that someone is going to say yes. You know, that a reader is going to say yes. Like no matter that they that you know, as a reader and as a writer, you can make these leaps together. I think is the most incredible thing about speculative fiction. Um, on a more like, you know, tiny thematic level, I feel like I'm really interested in what technology has done to my brain, kind of. I, and I feel like for the era in which I've, I've grown up, um, I'm, I'm 35 and I, I just, I feel like I, I, I came of age at like, you know, just when, like I, I've, I feel like I've lived in both eras, sort of. And, you know, it, the, the, the technologies I'm thinking of like appeared at like a crucial moment in like my kind of brain development and what that has done to me and what has done to, my generation and then like earlier and subsequent generations um, is something that is endlessly fascinating to me and something I can't imagine being done thinking and writing about for a very long time. We have another question. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, lovely conversation. Also a fellow writer here. Uh, my question was more about uh, culture. I feel like do you, do you think there's a relationship between various cultures and the blurring factor between reality and fantasy? Because I tend to see that there's more of a more refined or more defined blur. I mean, it's almost hard to see a separation between fantasy and reality moving eastward because I come from a Middle Eastern culture. So it's almost like they're very... Um, they're very similar. They're, uh, it's an everyday part of life, so to speak. What do you think about that? You write. <laughs> um, there's a, a talk about a helmet of limitation. There's a white Western sort of construct that separates um, the concepts you're speaking to, you know, and codifies them, and you know puts them through the industrial capitalist machine in a way that keeps them separate. Um, indigenous cultures and even pre-linguistic cultures would, uh, you know, keep the ideas you're talking about within the realm of existence of a human or a tree or a fox or the sky. And so the storytelling would keep those connections alive as existence or being or becoming. Um, and you know, that this is partly why I think we don't know ourselves yet because we're still separating kinds of knowledge and cultures, yeah. to put it the way you posed your questions, in ways that are not helping us mm. see, hear, and understand each other. If you are a storyteller who is um, making those questions on the page and, and presenting the storytelling in the ways that you value, then we want you, I want to buy your books hardbound, and so give us your name and how to find you. And Storytelling itself has to undergo several more adaptations before we get anywhere from my singular point of view. And that's one place where it needs the most work. I feel like this is a really exciting time right now. I feel like that that question is being interrogated and a lot more traditions of storytelling are, are coming to the fore. Um, I saw a Chelsea Vowell speak recently, um, and she's an indigenous and Métis writer who was talking about indigenous and Métis futurisms and this and this, this same kind of like different conception of what 
speculative fiction even means um, and the power to imagine specific futures uh, without, you know, without just thinking about survival or incrementalism and, be, you know, the truly open imaginative power. And I think a lot of people are like talking about writing about this in like really fascinating ways right now. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to live right now and to be reading and writing right now um, for, for that very reason. I agree. And just to add more context, I am currently in the submission stage. So uh, it's a very, if anybody knows about that stage, it's very uh, difficult. So if you could just talk to editors and you know, prod them a little bit. For the <laughs> of course, I'm joking. Uh, but a follow-up question, if you don't mind me, is are you both plotters or pantsers when it comes to writing? Because I'm just curious. Plotters or pantsers is how you put it? Yes, that's, I think that's how the writing world usually defines both. I've heard it as architect or gardener, but that okay. one's much, that's much more fun. <laughs> um, uh, definitely pantser in that, in that respect. Um, I always don't know what I'm doing in a first draft. Um, I, I always have to just see how things grow organically and usually go the wrong direction for, for a long time and reel back and you know, write, a, write a thousand drafts that take place in entirely different universes but feel like the same project to me. Um, yeah, as, as we talked about, I had to give up on the whiteboard. I, I have to confess, I thought the second word you said was pantsers, and I was like, what's pantsing? Is this, what's pa am I a pantser? <laughs> um, so there's that. I had to make my way through that. And the, I think plot is a hegemonic force of evil from the man. Yes. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. So um, I do want to say, too, uh, Kim and Lydia will be signing books at 2.30. So definitely take both of these down there and get them signed. Um, that's all the time we have. Lydia, Kim, thank you so much. Uh, it's just a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you.